let me tell you, I got some interesting facts to show you the influence that the African American had in our workforce in Atlantic City from the early years. Back in 1870, 8% of the workforce in Atlantic City was African American. By 1880, it was 14%. By 1900, it was 95% when the building swell started and the growth of all the different types of businesses and entertainment venues uh, came about, the rolling chair business blossomed, and it was amazing to see. Back in 1900, 12% of blacks lived on Pacific Avenue. Over one-third of the black population lived on Atlantic or Pacific. There was no restriction to where they could live. The population was 24% black in 1900. Now, around 1915, by some designation, I won't blame it on the city uh, because technically it can't, but there was some polarization by the back black population anyway. It was a polarization by Jews, by Irish, by Italians to be together in your own community. So blacks did that as well. But the, then came a designated area that blacks could own property. And that was from Connecticut Avenue to our Kansas Avenue, from north of Atlantic to a border somewhere irregular uh, up by Venice Park and through that area. Well, it stopped at Venice Park. Well, I'm saying, yeah, okay. but over okay. irregularly okay. shaped. Right. The other was rather clear. But what I wanted to bring out, it, the other day it just dawned on me that I always wondered why there was a Gramercy Place, Melrose, and Madison Avenue, and why there was a Winchester and Fairmont Avenue, because that's exactly where the border broke for black and white, and I'm sure that the white people didn't want to have Arctic Avenue as their as address, address or whatever, yeah, so it got changed. And it took all this time of me learning, <laughs> but I couldn't realize it. Yeah, yeah. And then I saw the delineation of the area, and I'm sure as I'm sitting here that that's why that got changed and created those Ooh, streets. you're absolutely right, because that's another part of that Mason-Dixon line. It went up, it went north, and then ended up going back west, back to the bay. Yeah. <laughs> I think by about 1920, yeah. I, would, I would think that Atlantic City probably had the highest block population of any northern city. At the end, um, and the wealthiest. Um, right, probably yeah. what, 35, 40 percent black? At Absolutely. Peak. Absolutely. Today Wait, who's got those numbers? Today well, what is it today? Today, I would guess 35, 40 percent. Maybe 27, 28. Well, it's gone yeah, down. Yeah, 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 it's gone down. down. The city has become a more international city, as you see, you see it next Asian to you. Population. Yeah, it's more like a little New York, um, you know, with our wonderful different stores and our different kinds of everything we have here now. It's great. I love it. And I love you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ralph, you mentioned the, the uh, ballpark, uh, Backrack Ballpark. Yes. And now they um, hosted largely uh, so-called colored league. Games Negro League. Back then. Negro, Negro League, League. Color League. Get it straight now, man. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard it called Color League. Color League. Uh, the crowds at those games was almost 100% uh, African American. Am I correct? Uh, it was a mixed crowd, of course. It was a mixed yeah, crowd. Yeah, uh, Nucky Johnson, but, as well as, as Hep Farley and all those guys, had their own teams that they sponsored yeah. in the Negro League. Yeah. Even the golf, golf team they had. Right. But, um, the population of Atlantic City was very, very heavily African-American at that time. And African-Americans would travel here as the trains brought those six, 700 people here a day. Uh, the black folks didn't come up on the train back in the old days. They'd have to come up near Model T Ford, or they came up on bus, or they just took their time getting here. And once they got here, they had to stay two or three days because they were so damn tired they couldn't get back on that, back of <laughs> that damn bus again, you know, and go back to where they came from. Uh, Great ball player, uh, Pop Lloyd, Pop Lloyd, who has Pop a stadium Lloyd, icon, name icon. He played for John, for uh, Backrack's team. That's right. I think it was called the Atlantic Giants. City Backrack Giants. Backrack Giants. Giants. Yeah. Backrack. And he played in that ballpark. Second. Yes, he did. Uh, and set records in that ballpark. Incredible. But I, I wasn't sure what the makeup of the crowd was. You were talking earlier about um, the idea of uh, money leaving the, the community, the north side. But that was still 
very much contained within the community. Yeah, that stayed in the community, yes. Yeah. Yeah. If somebody sold a bottle of pop, I mean, the, whoever sold the pop or a yeah. slice of uh, watermelon or whatever, it's, that money stayed in that community. Yeah. Stay right on the north side. I, I don't think people realize <clears throat> what a force Madam Sarah Spencer Washington Fair was. Enough. She not only in the 30s was a millionaire businesswoman, a black millionaire businesswoman, but she did something. She's my favorite historical character in Atlantic City. We had Easter parades on the boardwalk, yeah, and no right matter how fine a black woman dressed yeah. up, <laughs> she would never. Did I step on your line, Ralph? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But she would never. No African American woman could ever win. And Madam Sarah Sputz, Washington started her own black Easter parade on Arctic Avenue. And these women were, I have many pictures of them, they were yes. just magnificently dressed. She Her did course. everything to bring pride. She had the Apex Beauty product, which was sold, as we said, manufactured in eight or 10 different cities. Uh, she had a house for a wayward woman at the time. Her mother had what, that place on Pennsylvania Avenue. Her mother had the place. Yeah, uh -huh. She started and the And she Apex. was a hunter too, by the way, but I, don't know, I can't find the money. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when black golfers were not allowed to play at the White Country Club, she started her own. Apex Country Club, Apex absolutely. Apex Country Club. She did so much. She actually owned the Brigantine Hotel and absolutely. sold it to Father yeah. Divine. And sold it to Father Divine, yeah. She did more, and she was respected by every white politician in yes. the city. Was she, she was a smart woman. Brilliant. She was, she yeah. was really something. Can't hear you. <laughs> Good time, all time, every time I might walk. 